we have an area, I don't know how many children are actually here, but we have an area of, that's going to be available. Well, childlike mind, yeah. Uh, we have an area back there that has some toys and stuff, so. Well, anyway, um, huh. I don't know, I was asked to kind of, uh, keep it down over there, would you? Come on. It does. Well, it makes you question whether the thing you're tr trying to say isn't that important or not, you know. But, but um, no, I was um, asked to, what are you doing? Okay, well, you did a good job. Forget the notes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wow. Hey, that reminds me of uh, when I was inducted into the Army. We had a guy, a sergeant, that started going through his speech. To, I mean, every class came through, he gave the same speech, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, somehow he got interrupted. And this is how focused his mind is. <laughs> when the distraction quit, he didn't pick up where he left off. He went right back to the beginning <laughs> and started the whole class over again. But I mean, you know, routine is routine. Um, anyway, I was, you know, trying to encourage everyone. Uh, tonight's going to be one of those nights where we hope the Holy Spirit shows up in brute force, does a work in all of us. We come out purer and holier and fresher than we have been. Anyway, my year this year has been challenged a few times, health-wise, but it's all been good. And, um, but there's always those things that come up, either a distraction or a test results or a negative nurse or whatever it is, you know. And, uh, but what I've learned to kind of not be distracted by is um, the script there has really ministered to me lately is 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And uh, that's exactly where my eyesight has been on the eternal. Because as, if you focus on the results of this or the prognosis of that, you're headed for the cellar. And uh, I'm not allowing him to do that. So um, I'm just encouraging, trying to encourage you all tonight, just kick those little darts that are trying to eat at you away and allow him to come in and minister to you tonight. So with that, I'll give it to Matt. Thank you, Mike. All right. How's everybody doing? We've got um, no, uh, well, one special announcement, but that's going to be reserved for Dwayne to announce. So I have the, the, uh, the basics. Um, if you haven't heard, we have a uh, newer Abide team. Basically, it's offering um, kind of an all-encompassing ministry if you're a new believer. Um, we love to get people plugged in, baptized, explain, you know, the importance of baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, if you're an old believer, haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we'd love to minister to you in that as well. Um, if you need deliverance or inner healing, um, it's kind of an all-encompassing ministry. Um, just kind of take it as a case-by-case -case basis. We have Forms over there on the table, uh, if you're interested or if you know someone who is, we'd love to connect with you. Um, <clears throat> and then, let's see here, we have our uh, Firehouse Prophetic Home Hubs. Um, those are alive and running. We have quite a few now. What do we got, five or six all together, something like that. Um, they're listed on there. Um, if you have any questions or want to connect to those, feel free to call any of those leaders. And uh, I believe it's still open. If you'd like to host uh, a prophetic home hub, um, you can talk to Dwayne, Angela, 
Twain? Yeah. And then there's the website as well for training. So, yeah, I think that's about it for today. So. Dwayne. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Before I get on to the big news, we would, would just want to thank you guys for your incredible faithfulness. Not going to belabor this. Um, we just thank you. We thank you for your generosity, um, for just giving when God says to give, and that's all we're asking. So while I'm passing these around, well, not me, but you guys, um, help me. I'm tethered. Um, this coming Saturday, not tomorrow, uh, September 14th at 3 p.m. I can't look at the sound man, because I am the sound man. Um, <laughs> We're going to have um, a combo thing. We're going to have a taco gathering for whosoever. And we're going to have water baptisms at the lovely and generous Sandra Martin's home. Sandra, sorry. Sandra. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, Tracy is going to start passing around a clipboard, and on the clipboard are the usual things. Um, we're having tacos, and we're, we're providing some meat, but we're not providing everything. So kind of potluck style, and if you would write down, I believe there's a attendance sheet on there if you're interested in coming, um, what you'd like to bring. That doesn't mean if you don't put anything on there you can't show up. Of course, show up, bring your friends. Um, and also on that, there's little slips for the address of where we're having it. Um, so just take one of those little slips. And she just threw the birthday. Yes. <laughs> yep, yep. <coughs> and there will be balloons on the street. I'm going to try to get balloons and put them on the street because we, we blew by it the last time we were there. It's very easy to do. Her yeah, house. That, that was the so problem. you actually do need the address. Google Maps will take you somewhere else. Yeah. And it's a weird so. curve where the name of the street changes on the curve. And she's shortly after, so it's it's awkward. So there'll be balloons um, on the on the road to help you. And you'll keep driving up the driveway swearing that you're gonna meet hillbillies playing banjos with guns or something like that the farther you go up. It's it's really it, yeah. It is paved, yeah. Um, let's see. Bring, it's going to be totally outdoors. We'll be able to use the bathrooms. But that's it. So bring your chairs. Um, water baptism. Um, new believers. Who? What did he say? Old believers. I, <laughs> I'm just trying to not say it like that. But I mean, believers. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. And, you know, like is, is typical nowadays um, in a lot of churches, if you just show up and you suddenly feel like the Holy Spirit saying, do this, then do this. We'll try to have some towels, extra towels and stuff like that. But perhaps think about that when you're getting dressed in the morning. <laughs> Don't wear all white. Don't. Oh, wait, it's after Labor Day. That's a faux pas, isn't it? Yeah, you can't, you can't wear all, all white. Um, and bring your friends. Um, we're okay with that. We'd like to meet them. And anybody that you know that wants to be water baptized, come on out. Yeah? Yeah? It's you. Sorry. That was awkward, but that's okay. What about you? Come up. I forgot that I wanted Kathleen to come up. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So. I know. Well, that's why I'm telling you. So I'm all about voting. Um, I just want to encourage everybody to get registered. It's that time. November's going to be here before we know it. So if you're not, and friends, tell your friends to get registered. It's a really critical year. And um, yeah, we want to have, you know, it's funny. If the whole body of Christ voted, we would be a majority. But unfortunately, it's not like that. It's not like that, that people even think that their vote matters. But it does matter. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you've moved, if you've bought a new car, sometimes they change it because the DMV, I've heard. Um, let's see. 
an address change, of course. Um, Well, it's OregonVote.gov, and you can check to see if you're registered and how you're registered. Like if they have you with the right party, and you know have your name right, and all that good stuff. OregonVote.gov. And then I just also wanted to say that I am actually running for city council. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a god assignment. It's bigger than me, believe you. Me, and, um, but the thing that's making it doable is that we're running as a slate. The Republican Party is endorsing four new city council members and a mayor. So if we all vote that way, we can flip the council and we can get some common sense things done in this town. Yeah, I mean, it looks good that the homeless have moved to other lots, but now they're trying to make a shelter and you know all the stuff that it's like, <laughs> The taxpayers don't need. Anyway, I won't get on that bandwagon. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you for registering and voting. Yes. Um, <coughs> here I can. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Um, you've probably kind of figured out by now that we're a community, we're a family, we're all uh, laid back around here. So um, if you're new, we welcome you. We thank you so much for joining us. Um, and just as way of, thank you, sir, as way of introduction, um, Dwayne and Tracy, if you could raise your hand, Tracy, these two, there are elders here at Firehouse. They do um, an incredible job in that role. Um, we, I always say that Firehouse wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the two of them. They're amazing. I really, really appreciate them. Um, the gentleman who got up, Mike Meir, amazing man of God who happens to be my father-in-law. I'm just so grateful for both of you and you and Nancy. And, um, and of course, Matt, who does such an awesome ta job every time. So we appreciate you guys. All right. Well, give me a second just to wet my whistle. Um, is my um, laptop hooked up? I just need to open it. Okay. So um, forgive the fact that I'm going to be using a PowerPoint, but I am a teacher at heart. Um, and this is just the best way for me to convey what I think is going to be hopefully very important information for you guys. Um, what we're talking, yay, Brad and Julia are here. <laughs> so good to see you guys, we love you guys. No, that's baby Cassia. How old is she now? Six weeks, Six weeks man. <laughs> Welcome you guys, we missed you. <laughs> Hi, Cyrus. <laughs> Cute family. Okay, so I'm getting a updating information thing here. I don't like that. Okay, so. Starting the updates? I know, right? <laughs> Okay, it looks like it's opening. Praise Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So I'm going to be talking today about deliverance, and we will be having worship, but I wanted to kind of flip the script a little bit tonight because what I wanted to do was teach you about deliverance before we actually activate it, right? And one of the best ways to activate deliverance is in an atmosphere of holiness, you guys catch that? <laughs> in the atmosphere of holiness, the Lord begins to do his great work that begins to cause people to have the things that need to come out of them come out of them. And so I wanted to teach first, then move into worship so that we'd have an ability to see the Lord do his great work in us, right? And so um, so we're doing things a little differently tonight, um, but I this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about because it's really big in the body of Christ right now. I was just talking 
talking with Crystal and Jason three years ago, the body of Christ wasn't even sure that we should talk about deliverance. You guys remember those days? <laughs> um, in fact, my father-in-law told me he remembers being a part of a church that split over the issue of deliverance. And, um, and so like, there has been a real shift in the body of Christ around this topic. I, For me, one of the people that I look to that I think has done really pioneering work in the area of deliverance is Apostle Catherine Crick out of Los Angeles. And she, um, she is moving in people getting delivered by the you know dozens when she has her meetings and um, and what's happening is that we're seeing people being freed up into joy peace hope righteousness and not being tied down to these things that the enemy's trying to keep us tied down to right and so it's becoming a really big thing and we're seeing more and more of it and we've seen um, quite a bit of it here as well. And so I want to talk about why deliverance is important. Hey, guys, good to see you guys. Um, why deliverance is important. Um, we are now in a season of history where health in the soul is greatly valued. Health in the soul is greatly valued. You guys know what I mean. Um, having internal peace. Having a p- ability to be in joy. Knowing what it means that you're in right standing with Christ. That's health of soul. And when we have those things, we are able to partake of something that has a rich, um, Jesus put it this way, I am the bread of life, I am the water of life. In other words, when we partake of Jesus to the deepest parts of ourselves, we are partaking of something that has life-giving substance to it. How many of us could have more of that, right? And that's exactly what deliverance does, is it releases from our soul any place where demons have enthroned themselves. It's just that simple, right? We talk about in Psalms, but Jesus is enthroned, God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. Demons also try to enthrone themselves in our souls, right? And so um, it's, we're now in a place where we are learning how to let the, that stuff go so that we can have more peace, more joy, more righteousness in our life. And let's see, um, you know, it's funny to say the word righteousness because we tend to think of righteousness as like the religious people who are really strict or something like that when we think of righteousness. What righteousness is at the heart of it is freedom to do what is right for yourself and for people around you. You're not enslaved to things. You're not enslaved to greed. You're not enslaved to food. You're not enslaved to addictions. You're not um, hiding behind insecurities or fears, right? That's what it is. It's a freedom to actually be who you are and what God has called you to be. And so um, that's what we're looking at, is that we fi- we're finding more and more that the body of Christ is coming out of bad theology about this, which is why deliverance wasn't happening so much. And we're now seeing more and more good theology about how deliverance works, okay? So we're going to talk about that next. What is a theology of deliverance? Um, so I... I've been preaching this at the school for quite some time, and I think it's really important that we understand how how deliverance works within ourselves, okay? Because part of the question that's always been, um, uh, you know, people are always wondering, well, can Christians have a demon? Have you guys heard this? Yeah, Yeah. can Christians have a demon, right? And so this is what, um, when I was talking to Mike a few years ago, he said that's what his church split over. Half the church thought that a Christian could, and half the church thought that someone couldn't, right? So we just thank you, Father God, for the work that you're already doing in the room. So, Father God, we just praise you right now in Jesus' name for what you're already doing in the room. We praise you, Father God. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. We say your righteousness is building itself up within us. We thank Thank you, Lord, for it. So when we talk about deliverance, spirit, soul, and body, um, our spirit man, it says in Ephesians 2, that our spirit man comes alive when we come into Christ. Isn't that interesting? In other words, our spirit man is dead within us before Christ. Our spirit does not actually have um, a function. But in Ephesians 2, it says, you've come alive. Your spirit man comes alive, right? And that spirit man is perfect, seated in Christ, and in the high places with him, right? That spirit man is the thing by which we understand Father God, who is what? Spirit, 
right? So our spirit speaks to him who is spirit. That thing is perfect, what he has made alive in us. However, we have another part of us called our soul. And it's our soul that carries the personality, okay, so your personality, its store of memories, tools, and functions. And this is where people can have a demon, whether you're Christian or not right? So your spirit man is perfect and it's not going to be touched by those things, but your soul is still working out its salvation. And so what you see in the Greek, there's this tense that they use in the Greek that we don't really use here in English, but it really means like it's happening and it's continuing happening. It's happened and it's still happening, right? And that's what they say when that verse says your, your soul is being saved, it really means your soul is continually being saved. It's ongoing being saved. And so what's happening is just like the Israelites had to take the promised land bit by bit, we take our souls bit by bit. That is a metaphor that God gave us in the Old Testament that they couldn't take the entire promised land in one day. They had to take it city by city. And that's how we take our souls. By patience, it says, possess your souls. You guys know that verse? By patience, possess your souls. In other words, bit by bit, Jesus has more and more authority in our soul. And so our soul has these memories and it, demons can enthrone there. So maybe you... Um, Maybe you have a memory of, and I'm just, look, don't get upset if I pick out your memory, okay? <laughs> Sometimes I do that, and that's not intentional. But maybe you ha have this memory of your father speaking to you in a way that completely degraded you. And that memory has festered over time. And as it's festered over time, demons have been able to enthrone themselves in that memory. And so you carry things like bitterness, maybe, or anger, or fear about someone talking to you like that again. And what it does is it keeps you locked in that memory. And that demon keeps you in, slaved. Really, you're being enslaved to it. We, you guys know this. Um, more and more science is seeing the benefits of forgiveness, right? And when we forgive people, science says there's a whole bunch of things that happen in, in the way that our souls carry ourselves through life. And that is a spiritual principle that science is now backing, right? And so demons can enthrone themselves in that. Another place that demons can enthrone themselves is, to, is in the tools that we've learned. Okay, the tools that we've learned. These are things that we've learned to do to protect ourselves from things happening again. Maybe we have like a fear, and so we do certain things like, I'll never go into a house that looks like X, Y, and Z. And it's like a tool that we have to keep ourselves from, and maybe, maybe you had a sexual encounter that was very terrible in a particular place, and I will never go to that town again. I know someone who, who actually says, I will never go to that town again. And so you're enslaved to that memory, and you have this tool, right, to prevent yourself from having to feel that feeling again or whatever. So those are places where demons can enthrone themselves as, where, as well, is the tools that we use. Maybe it's the way that we speak, the way we allow people to speak to us, who we surround ourselves with. All of these are tools that the enemy can use to keep us enslaved in our souls. The third place, and, and these are just a few of them. I'm just trying to give you guys a sense of how the soul can hold on to a, a demonic, um, you know, a, a demonic throne. Um, and the third place is a function. So maybe we've learned how to function in the world in a way that's demonic rather than a way that's righteous. So for instance, maybe someone says something and you're triggered and the instant emotion is anger. That is usually a demon's there. And that instant anger isn't what you want, but it's what you do. It's how you function, right? Or um, someone will say something and who knows what it will, and it just triggers betrayal. Like they've betrayed me. Right? These are the way we function that demons have taught us to function this way. 
Do you guys understand what I'm saying? And so what happens is that the soul carries these different things, and the soul is the place where the, the demon will try and throne himself so that you can keep being enslaved to the devil. And so you may be a Christian in your spirit, but when you're at the 7-Eleven, and the gas guy doesn't do the things that you want him to do, and anger comes exploding out of you, you don't feel like a Christian so much in that moment, right? Because you're enslaved to something. So the third thing is the body. Now, the body um, doesn't necessarily carry demons, but it can react to the demonic in your soul. Okay, so we can see this in physical infirmities. Um, one of them that we see in a lot is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, or really anything that their doctors are like, we don't know where this comes from. 100% guarantee there's a demon thing going on that's fueling what's going on in your body. And so what we see a lot of times is when we take people through deliverance, they also get healed. So we see this, they, the two come in hand in hand, yeah. right? Another one is a physiological impairment, so like a schizophrenia. So like with schizophrenia, that can actually be a psychological thing that's happening with your, with your brain, but then the enemy can like make it worse, right? He can exaggerate the symptoms. So you may need to take medication to like for those symptoms, but the enemy, if it, a demon is there, he can make it 10 times worse, right? Do you, are you guys following me? Okay, so we can see how the body reacts to these things, and we see it in sicknesses, emotional things, we see it in the way that we are um, driven by these things that enthrone themselves in us, and it's not the way we want to be. We want to be loving. We want to be filled with joy. We want to be filled with peace. But these things are driving us, right? So um, let's go to the next one. So I want to talk a little bit about this because people think to themselves, well, you know, is, well, I'll just say it this way. We have lots of really good records of what was going on in the first century church. We have a lot of writings, and these people weren't necessarily included in the Bible, but these people who were, con were, were um, considered early church fathers, okay? And this is an early church father, and scholar Clinton Arnold wrote this. And this is just fascinating to me, so bear with me as I read it. Um, these were the things that they helped new believers do. They had immersion in the, world, in the word, okay? They taught central doctrines of the faith. They had spiritual and moral formation, and they had deliverance ministry. Listen to what they say. From the day they are chosen, let a hand be laid on them and let them be exercised daily. Yeah. So, yeah. So these are new believers. This is how they handled new believers in the first century, right after Christ. They did exorcisms daily. And when the day draws near on which they are to be baptized, they mean water baptized here, let the bishop himself exercise each one of them that he may be certain that he is purified. In other words, they didn't do water baptisms until they were positive that they had gotten every demon out of them. And talk about, like you said, Brad, that's the complete opposite of what we do now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that was standard practice for new believers in the first century. And when we start to realize that we've kind of wandered away from standard practice, it helps us realize, like, oh, <laughs> we've got work to do. And that is the work of Jesus. And Jesus says in Mark 16, he says, part of your job as a believer is that these signs will follow you. You will cast out demons. This is one of the signs that follows you, right? And I made a joke with Crystal when, before we were starting that um, you know, we were missionaries on the mission field, and I saw um, demonic possession quite often. And when we came back to America, I'm like, oh, well, all the demons must be in Central America <laughs> because I didn't see any here, right? Because they were more, you know, uh, they're more hidden, Right, And so that's not the case. <laughs> They're everywhere. Um, but the thing that we need to recognize is that the church is coming back to its spiritual roots of helping people get rid of the demonic in their life. 
Now, what usually comes up at this point is people start asking questions like, do I have a demon? <laughs> and that's a good question to ask. It really is. And I'll tell you, the reason why it's so good to, do, to be asking that question is because it puts us in a place of humility. I have submitted myself to a Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the one that tells me about my soul, not me. I'm going to say that again. He's the one that tells me about my soul, yeah. not me. If I'm the one telling me about my soul, guess what about who can be deceived? This person, right? So wow. I let him tell me about my soul. I don't tell him about my soul. So if he's telling me we need to deal with something, I take that seriously. And that's our place of humility as believers, right? Is that we say we get the, the glorious job of continually taking bit and bit of our soul, just like they took the promised land. There is a move of God in the heart of men right now to, to do such a thorough work in our life. We have been through a lot as the body of Christ, right? It's been a hard season, but we're on the other side of it. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to be like, oh, the fruit of going through some of this hard stuff is incredible because I'm looking at what's going on inside of me and now I understand why he died for me. <laughs> like we're treasures, you guys. Each and every one of us, we're treasures. And he is not interested in any bit of us being enslaved to the God of this world, little G God, Satan, right? He wants us to be totally freed up to be his. Yeah. And, and when we do that, um, we, we get to take possession of our souls. So in James 5, it says this, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other mm -hmm. so that you can live together whole and healed. I'm going to say that again. Whoa. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed whole and healed. James 5, 16 through 18. Mm -hmm. I want to take a second right now and speak to those who are watching on, on, on the video. We're getting more and more people watching us on video. And I want to let you know that even though you're watching this on video, um, I believe that the Lord wants to free you up there too. Um, and so stay tuned with us today because one of the things that happens when, when, a, when a demon starts to get um, a little concerned that he might be in a place where he has to go is you'll get this urge to leave or an urge to turn off the video camera, whichever position you're in. And, and that's because he knows that his time is up, right? That demon's time is up. And so I just want to encourage you as we go through this that we're going to get to it. So, signs that you are dealing with a demon. These are some of the things that could be occurring. Reoccurring thoughts that you can't control. Addictions. Inability to be in a place where God's power is truly moving. Ongoing masturbation. Quick anger responses. Inability to control what you say. Jealousy, envy, bitterness, unforgiveness, inability to love genuinely and without motives, uncontrollable fears or phobias, greed, judgments, pride. It's a partial list, and there's probably other things that I missed here, but that's a, that's a good start. Some of these things are things like, let me, let me give you guys an example. Um, I know that early on when I started ministry, the enemy was very intent in making sure that I was in a place of bitterness about some things that were going on. And 
um, I had to work almost daily for the Lord to renew my mind and be in a place of forgiveness about this situation. Because I knew that if I went into a place of bitterness, that's a place where a demon can enthrone himself, right? And so I wanted to be in a place where the Lord just renewed my mind so that I wasn't falling into these things, right? Um, so you may recognize some of these things and say, yep, that's that's me. And um, if that's the case, then, then praise the Lord because he is revealing it. He's showing you something. I wanted to talk specifically about religious demons or what we call a pharisaical spirit. Um, because sometimes people who have been in church for a long time, this is what they'll deal with, right? They may deal with a religious demon rather than actually um, something that may look more like a, an anger demon or something like that. So this is what will keep you bound to religion but not bound to God's power. I'm going to say that again. A religious demon will keep you bound to religion but not bound to power, God's power working through you. How can you tell that God's power is working through you? You have the ability to forgive people quickly. (laughs) You have the ability to do um, uh, things out of a place of faith where your fear doesn't doesn't tell you what to do, right? I'm going to say that one again because I felt like I was hitting on something. (laughs) You have the ability to do things in faith because your fears aren't telling you what to do. Right? So religious demons can look like judgment. They can be judging people by their looks, their ability in scripture, different social classes, rather than truly seeing people by the spirit. Right? Um, they will use scripture or religious cliches rather than actually feeling emotions or feeling for the person that they're dealing with, right? You guys know what I mean by this. This is the person that you pour out your heart about something that's going on in your life, and they just give you a religious cliche or a scripture instead of actually being with you and letting the emotion of sitting with you be there. Why, why do I want to point that out? We see Jesus, when he healed people, it says he moved with compassion, My number one prayer tonight when I was praying over us getting ready for tonight was that I would move with compassion. I never want to be the person who's moving out of religious duty. I want to feel things for you guys. I want to genuinely love you guys. And so, like, it's so important that we recognize where we're allowing religious cliches so that we don't actually have to feel, because feeling is uncomfortable sometimes. It's like, I don't want to feel for that person. (laughs) It takes up a lot of my energy and my time or whatever, but that's what we're here on earth for, is to be Christ for other people, right? So um, another one could be looking down on a a different denomination or how people do worship differently than you. Um, Inability to cooperate with churches or ministries. Um, Sometimes people, this will be where they just don't do church at all or they they don't want to be involved in in the various things that are going on in the community that are Christian. Um, Thinking that your church or ministry does it better than everyone else's. Um, Thinking that God can only work through you but not others because they have X, Y, and Z problems. (laughs) Um, A lack of generosity or tithing. So these are all different ways that a religious spirit can begin to be working through you, and it looks good, but it's not actually good. Do you see what I'm saying by that? That was what the Pharisees were about. The Pharisees were about looking good. Jesus says they're on the street corners, and they're like shining up their faces when they're fasting, so they look like they're fasting, right? It's all about looking good and looking religious without actually having the heart behind it. And so when you have this this thing at work in you, um, what the Lord will begin to do is he will begin to break your heart. And you will have to come into real emotion, (laughs) really feeling for people, really having compassion for people. In fact, I just want to take a moment, and the Lord spoke to me about our brother Greg here this week. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, are people hearing the message of my servant, Greg? That's what they said. Are people hearing the message of my servant, Greg? And Greg has been bringing a message to the churches about the homeless problem. 
right? And the, I was really convicted by it because the churches in this area, we've had so many problems with the homeless. We've, we've been swung to one pendulum and now we're wanting to swing to the other pendulum and we're forgetting the cry of God for the people in the highways and the byways. And Greg is bringing a message to the churches about the homeless, about be caring for them, about being caring about what they're doing, right? And so the Lord just spoke to me and he said, I don't think the churches are hearing the message that my servant Greg is, is sharing. So I just wanted to say thank you, Greg, for carrying a message that's pretty unpopular right now. And you know it's unpopular. And, and I think that what the Lord is saying is that even though we may have had a community-wide problem with this, we can't swing to the other pendulum and not be Christian about it right? We can't do that. We need to figure out where we're supposed to be in our hearts about a situation that's difficult. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we're supposed to harden our hearts to a problem in our community. Okay, so th Greg, thank you for making sure our hearts aren't getting hard. We appreciate you. Yeah, he deserves that. Thank you, Teresa. So after deliverance, you may need um, other things, and so, you know, deliverance, luckily, is quick and easy. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord just takes care of it, right? But there's things that we need to do on the other side to make sure that we maintain our deliverance. <laughs> One of those things might be inner healing, okay? So you may need to talk with a counselor or someone who does inner healing. We have several people here who do that. Um, uh, uh, Kathleen does that. And... Um, our abide team does that. And basically that is where the Lord begins to heal you from a place of maybe where there's been trauma, right? Because you need to relearn how to be in the world without that demon. Okay, so let me give you an example. Say, um, um, just checking to make sure where we are with kids in the room. Um, say you had a incident as a child that was bad, okay? And um, it was an abuse incident. And when a demon comes into that, he's able to enthrone himself on the trauma of that thing so that you are driven by that memory, whether it's to protect yourself or whatever it might be. But once the demon is taken out, you may still need the Lord to heal you in, inside your soul, right? You may still need to talk with somebody to help you kind of heal up completely. When the demon is still there, you're never going to be able to heal, though. You guys see what I'm saying? It's going to make sure that you're reopening that wound as much as possible. So when we get rid of the demon, sometimes you'll need to have that inner healing. A second thing is that you may need to work on a renewed mind, okay? So this looks a lot works really good with people who are coming out of addictions. Okay, so any kind of addiction, I don't care if it's um, uh, alcohol, porn, um, you know, masturbation, whatever kind of addiction, this, what you'll need after a deliverance is a renewed mind. Because you'll need the Lord to begin to give you new uh, brain synapses. We've learned this about the brain, that the brain has patterns that it goes down. And when the demon comes out, it's easier for us to take on new patterns in the brain. But before the demon comes out, you can't ever think of a way of getting out of it. Your brain is making patterns of addiction, right? And so when we take the demon out, what happens is the Lord is using his word, the word of God, to put new neural pathways in your brain so that you can start thinking in different ways. But if you don't fill your brain with the word after your release from, from an addiction, what will happen is you'll want to fall back into those patterns, right? That's what we know about how the brain works. And so it's so important to be in the word. And so this could be something like, um, say you have a, a porn addiction, and it could be something like, I am the righteousness in Christ. Every time the enemy tries to tempt you with that porn addiction, you're saying, I am righteousness in Christ, right? And you are declaring what you really are, what the new pathways are in your brain, okay? Um, you may also need water baptism. And so we have this coming up next week because what water baptism does is it seals your new nature in Christ. It seals the deal. 
Now, what happens with water bath, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys a crazy story, okay? I have never heard of anything like this before. I've never seen anything like this before. But way back in the day, um, this is the cornerstone days, those of you who know what I'm talking about. Um, way back in the day, we were doing water baptism with some of our students. And what was happening is, as they were coming up out of the water, in, this is such a bizarre story, but it's a sign and a wonder. In the bubbles of the water, you could see demons coming out of people. Like literally, and we took pictures of them. <laughs> like there was like foxes, you could see like foxes, you could see like dogs, you could see these various things. Because what was happening is the actual, the power that's in water baptism was cleaning their souls right? It was cleaning their souls of whatever needed to come out. And so we were taking pictures after every person, and there was always some different demonic thing that we could see in the bubbles. <laughs> like, it was like, what is going on? But it really enforced into me the power of water baptism. Water baptism seals the deal with you in Christ. It's sealing you up so that your new nature can come forward right? When I was water baptized, um, I've been water baptized three times, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I don't have any problem with people having multiple baptisms, by the way. <laughs> I, I have no problem with that. Um, I, I sometimes think we come into greater and greater understanding of what a water baptism can do for us, and when we come into that greater understanding, it's an excellent idea to do it again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you're embracing that new thing that you're learning. But every time I've been water baptized, it's like I come out and my soul feels clean. Mm. Like I've had this internal scrub that's gone on. Mm. It's just the most beautiful feeling in the world. You guys know about Russell Brand's recent conversion? Yeah. He, is ex he experienced a very similar thing in his water baptism. He said, I, he said, I don't know how to describe it. I came out changed. And you can tell it in his interviews. He's a completely different man. And so, you know, um, it, it's just a powerful representation of what God does in these, um, these rituals that we sometimes just call them rituals, right? But they actually have power behind them. They have power to change us. And after deliverance, you may still be tempted that you will have power to overcome it. I'll tell you, for me, this happened in the realm of a religious spirit. I had a religious spirit that I had to be, um, uh, I had to have taken out of me, and when the Lord took it out of me, what would happen is, instead of moving towards judgment towards people, it was like I had a choice. And I was like, wait a second, I actually don't want to judge them. <laughs> I actually want to love them. <laughs> and it was like weird because I would be tempted to judge them, but I had the power not to. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Before there was no power to, to do anything but to judge them. It just happened. And I would be kicking myself afterwards like, why aren't I righteous in Christ? <laughs> the cool thing, you guys, about deliverance is that we have made... Christianity and into a psychological thing. And deliverance is, is about as far from that as it can get. Like psychology has its place, but what the Lord is wanting us to realize is that deliverance is his power hitting our souls and changing us from the inside out and making sure that we're no longer slaves to the things that we've been slaves to in the past. I have two non-negotiables for deliverance. Now, if you're here and you're like, man, I'm learning a lot and I want, I mean, <laughs> I think my neighbor needs deliverance or I think I need deliverance or whatever. Um, we're going to have a chance for everyone in this room to go through this tonight. But these are my two non-negotiables that I have for deliverance. So if you're running to your neighbor next week and they need a deliverance, these are my non-negotiables. One, I never deliver people unless they are connected to discipleship. Who is raising them up in Christ? Because what will happen, we have a, a warning in the scriptures that if, we, um, if someone gets delivered and they're not able to continue in the faith, the enemy comes in and makes it worse, is what it says, yep. right? So it's really important to me, I will not deliver people unless they have discipleship at work in their life, okay? Um, and I want their discipler to know 
that I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> because they need to know that they're working on something, right? So what good is it if I deliver someone from masturbation and they're going back home two, day, two hours later and their discipler isn't making sure that they're renewing their mind on that issue, right? Okay. The second thing is you cannot deliver people from something you have not overcome yourself. If someone comes to you and says, I have a spirit of anger, and you have not dealt with your own spirit of anger, <laughs> it's not a good idea to deliver them, okay? Because the only way that, it, and I'll just do this in the next slide. Demons do not respond to love. This is hard for Christians to hear. Demons do not respond to love. They respond to authority. And I have seen so many Christians try and love demons out of people. It does not work. You have to take authority over demons. I feel like this is kind of hitting a nerve, but I want it to hit a nerve. You cannot love a demon out of someone. <laughs> they just don't respond to it. This is why you see this all the time where women are like, well, I'll just love him and he'll just come into everything he's supposed to be. Nope. You got to deal with the demons. <laughs> and someone has to take authority over them. It's the only thing that demons respond to. Okay? So it's important that we recognize how does authority work in a believer so that we can deliver people. Okay? Because we all know how to love people. <laughs> well, maybe we don't all know, but you, we, we generally have a, an idea, right? Um, but we don't necessarily know how to stand in our authority. How many of you feel like you know how to stand in your authority? Yeah. When we stand in our authority, there's a couple things at work. First, we believe that God has given us authority to cast out devils. It's simple as that. Mark 16, 7 says this, those who believe in me will have these signs that follow them. They will cast out devils. So you just have to believe that he's given you the authority, right? Now, that's a whole sermon in and of itself, but... Um, that's part of it. The second is we gain authority in Christ as we conform to his image. As we conform to his image. The more we look like Christ, the more authority we carry in the spirit realm. So those things could be obedience to Christ. Maybe um, I'm like, Christ asked me to fast my favorite thing for six months. That's not easy. Have you guys ever had Jesus say, you need to fast something for a year or whatever? <laughs> he asked me to fast my favorite thing for six months. And I was telling Brady, he's like, have you had, like, like it's a food thing, right? It's like, it's sugar. I'm just going to say, it's sugar. And so like, and so like, it, Brady was like asking me in the grocery store. He was like, are, like, has it been hard? And I was like, oh, it's just like any other fast when the Lord tells me to do it. <laughs> Yep. It's been easy <laughs> because the yoke is easy and the burden is light when he tells me. But sometimes I'll get religious and I'll tell myself to fast something. <laughs> and those fasts are never easy. <laughs> but I'm learning obedience right now over my flesh. Do you know how often sugar is offered at parties and gatherings and da 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 right? So I am learning obedience over my flesh right now. So I'm going to gain authority in the spirit realm. It's good, right? Second thing is the things we suffer for Christ, not the things we suffer in our own being dumb. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have to say it, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what does it look like to suffer for Christ? It means when we are um, persecuted, and we think of persecution as martyrdom. Persecution can be like, I don't like that person because they're, they're, they think they're a prophet. <laughs> it, persecution can look like people, your own brothers and sisters in Christ not liking you. Your own brothers and sisters in Christ talking bad about you. Mm. Persecution can look like, um, you know, but in that you suffer and you could be conformed to his image. How did Christ handle it when his brothers and sisters talked about him? Right? He, 
it's interesting because it, I've been studying something that he said this week. And he said, who are my brothers and sisters? It's those who are obedient to my Father in heaven. And he starts pointing around at people around him who are not his literal blood, but they have become his brothers and sisters because they are on the same trajectory as him. And I've been considering that for my own life recently. Where have my brothers and sisters in Christ become more like family than my own brothers and sisters, right? And that's not, my, my brother's amazing. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not like, there's no reflection on that. But like, um, you, you guys understand, like, we, as we travel closer to him, the Lord brings us people around us. And so that could be a, a way of being conformed to Christ, is maybe we're suffering things in our literal family, right? And he's teaching us how to be um, more community-minded with the brothers and sisters of Christ, right? It could be ridding ourselves of demon or sin, which we've been talking about. That's another way we become conformed like Christ. And that's the easiest part, in my opinion. <laughs> because when he takes that demon out, I have the nature of Christ that wants to come out. If that demon is gone, it is so much easier to love people. It is so much easier not to judge. It is so much easier not to look at people according to the flesh. It is so much easier not to be angry at the gas station attendant. You know what I'm saying? And then when that stuff is out of us and we don't have to worry about it so much, we, like, there becomes something, and Crystal, you're really good at this. I love this about Crystal, and you guys will be like, yeah, she is really good at this. It's just like you just love the person in front of you right? It just, like, you're freed up to just love people and to meet them where they're at. That's what Jesus did. I mean, you guys have all seen The Chosen. He was so good at that, of just stopping for just people and meeting them where they were at, right? And finally, we become conformed to Christ's image through renewing our mind. So we let scripture tell us, we let Jesus tell us as the Lord over our soul who we are, rather than the world telling us who we are or ourselves telling us who we are. I'm going to say that again because we need to hear that. The world will tell you who you are. It's your job to whether or not you allow that. Right? And so because I have a Lord, I've, I've given myself over to Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. Because he's my Lord, he's the only one who gets to tell me who I am right? And sometimes he'll send you prophetic words or brothers and sisters to encourage you in the faith, right? All these things. And that'll be his voice coming through other vessels. But that's the only one that has the authority to say, Angela, you're X, Y, and Z. So anytime the world comes and says, you should be insecure because of this or that or that or that, I, I'm like, that's not who I am because Jesus told me something different. Right, And if that demon is gone of insecurity, I no longer have to believe the words that that demon's saying to me. Listen, I want to say something that just popped in my head. Sometimes demons will speak to you. That's another reason to get rid of them, is they will say things to you. And that if they're in you, they will try and conform your mind to their image rather than the image of Christ right? So you become debased to the slavery that they're trying to bring about in your own life. So I'm going to have um, Pamela and Luke come on up. We're going to do a little bit of background worship here. Now bear with me here, you guys, because we're in a trance, uh, uh, we're uh, stepping into a new thing, but I don't want us to lose what we're doing here tonight. And that is that I believe that the Lord wants to bring freedom in this house tonight and freedom to everybody who wants it, okay? And so we're going to have the worship leaders come up and begin to um, play, and um, we're going to do some music in a little bit, but I just want to open the door. Come on up and start playing. Um, and I'm going to engage um, the spirit of the Lord, okay? Um, uh, those of you who were on my broadcast a few weeks ago that I was doing on the new wine and the seven spirits of God, um, you will know that I had this revelation Actually, my husband helped this revelation come to pass, but um, the spirit of the Lord is this, is the desire of the Lord is for us to be in a place of freedom. That's his whole desire. 
to be freed up to worship him, to be freed up so that we're not wor- worshiping the demons that are in us or the demons that are in the world. He wants us freed up to worship him. So when Moses said, can you turn her down just a bit? When Moses said, let my people go, he didn't just say that. He said, let my people go that they may worship me. This is what the spirit of the Lord does is it frees us up to know Jesus and to worship Jesus and so that we're not worshiping these debased things that demonic things would want us to worship, okay? So let me just read this to you, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. Now the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. So this is what I want to say to you today. Um, I have a a minister um, friend and um, this person has seen a ton of deliverances, mostly among pastors in this last year. I'm gonna say that again. mostly among pastors. I'm saying that because I want you guys to understand we are all capable. That's where I'm standing. We are all capable of the enemy deceiving us, right? And so what I want you to do right now is I am going to have you close your eyes and we're going to go and in, move into a place of worship. And as we move into a place of worship, I just want you to worship him. And as you worship him, if the Lord brings anything to your mind, I want you to come up and we're going to be praying for you. Okay. And maybe you already know I have something and listen, I am not, go- we are not going to embarrass you. I want us to recognize that we are brothers and sisters in Christ right? And, and what happens, you guys need to understand this. When you are freed up from judgment, it doesn't matter what people come up and say. <laughs> like, honestly, when the Lord frees you up from judgment, it's just like, oh, it's just another thing that the enemy uses. It doesn't have any bearing on how I view people. Do you see what I'm saying? I see you in love. And so, um, and so I just want, if, uh, with eyes closed right now in this room, I just want to say, we invite right now the spirit of the Lord into the room in a heavier measure. We ask right now that that the angels would establish this house as a house where the spirit of the Lord could flow. We thank you for the increasing glory in this house right now. We thank you, Father God, that your glory is pushing out all that the enemy has attempted to do in our lives. And I just want to invite people to come on up if you want me to pray for you. We're going to pray for you. And I I believe we're not only going to see people delivered tonight, but we're also going to see people get healed, physically healed tonight as well. So just keep worshiping. And if if the Lord puts anything on your heart or if you're feeling uncomfortable, come up. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to say
you to keep engaged in your worship of the Lord. Um, what just happened with Suzanne was that the Lord revealed something to her. She confessed it before the Lord. She repented before the Lord. And, 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 and she, I was exp explaining to her that what you can begin to look for after the, the thing is gone that's empowering it is that you can begin to look for that you don't have the same responses to things right? The same responses to things. You may react to something totally different and you're in a place of freedom, reacting the way that you want to react, not reacting the way that you would normally react, okay? So um, I just want you guys to keep coming on up um, as the Lord has you come on up. And um, I just, those of you who are seated right now, two things, keep worshiping, and keep praying for what's going on up here, okay? Keep engaged in what the Lord's wanting to do in the room. Um, the Lord is strange. <laughs> Not as strange as I am, though. Um, 
I had an event that happened to me many years ago that I think was the foundation of being robbed of everything that I was before I was engaged in uh, war. And it's weird. Um, but being able to confess and ask forgiveness for the excitement of taking someone else's life, even if it's justified by being an enemy or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. It's war, war is weird. But what I'm getting at is what I've been carrying is all this anger and hurt and stuff for many years. And maybe I can gloss it over and cover it up in a lot of different ways. But when the burden is gone and you're filled with joy, there's, <laughs> there's a big difference, believe me. Anyway, so you're going to have to put up with me. I might actually be a kind, nice guy. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise his holy name. We just praise you, God. That's amazing. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. So keep praying for what's going on up here. That's incredible work. Lord, we thank you for setting the captives free. That is why Jesus came, was to set us free from these things that burden us. So we thank you, Father God, for that. Just so that you guys know, um, you guys are... Uh, I know a lot of you guys, and um, you don't have to tell me everything. You can just tell me, I am here to repent for, for whatever. And as you even do that, that repentance releases that. Um, when you repent, that demon cannot stay. It cannot stay. And so even as Mike was telling the testimony, a very serious testimony, did you notice he kept bubbling up with joy? <laughs> it's like the Lord is doing a work, and when he dislodges that thing, he fills it with his spirit, right? So praise the holy name. Praise the holy name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Lord, we thank you for what's happening. Just keep coming on up, and I'm just going to keep praying for you guys as you come on up.
We're going to move into some worship, but I want to just continue to encourage you guys to come on up, um, but move into a place of worship because what that will do is continue to set the atmosphere for what the Lord is doing in this place. Um, so the Father is showing me a vision, and it's of uh, uh, like a mine shaft, and it's it's an old one. It's nothing new or modern. It's an old one that's been used a lot. It's dusty. It's um, cobwebby. It's uh, the 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 wood is um, getting close to rotten. It's very dark. It smells bad. And so what he's showing me and saying is that he will always maintain that structure of the mind, the entrance into our soul, the entrance into our being. Um, he provides that so that we can let loose and, and, and there's always an exit for the enemy. And that once the enemy exits, he um, he lets those wooden shafts fall, wow. and they're closed, and they don't get to be opened again. They're completely. There's not one little bit of breathing room for the enemy to come in. Um, so I think what he's speaking is just that he's provided and um, always allows us to have access to the freedom of um, saying yes to him and letting the enemy exit. Yep, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the Lord, as I was putting this worship set together, it's probably the most different worship set I've ever done in all the years I've played. The Lord spoke to my heart about this song. And he said to me that this song that I'm going to sing at this moment is a declaration that he wanted me to do. And I said, but Lord, people probably won't know that song. And he said, that's okay. He said, I want you to do it. Because it's a it's speaking and singing a declaration over the people that will be there. So I said, okay, Lord. See the demons fall 
would see his spirit rise. Worship God with all your heart, sing his power down. Worship God with all your heart, the enemy be bound. Worship God with all your heart, sing his power Worship God with all your heart, the enemy be bound, the enemy be bound, the enemy be bound. Thank you, Jesus. for healing as well um so if you also like feel like the lord needs to heal you in your body please come on up thank you lord you guys keep worshiping you guys are doing great
the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I just need permanent catchers so that people can feel real rested to receive what the Lord wants to do. Um, so thank you, Cliff, for coming. I volunteered you, Cliff. Thank you.
Just one. 